Let's get into this conversation now. The CEO of the South African National Energy Development Institute, Dr. Zwanani Mate, has attributed the sudden increase in load shedding to the lack of sustainable maintenance at ESCOM's power plants. Mate says if the issue of the national grid stability is not taken seriously, then perhaps it is time to start planning for the worst case scenario. And that's a complete blackout. Dr. Mate joining me in studio now to discuss the measures and interventions that could be pursued to improve energy availability in the country. Dr. Mate, thank you very much for your time. I want to start off with um, what is contained in that article yeah. that you wrote. And key among them, you say that ESCOM has enough installed capacity, and that is to cater for demand, the operating reserves included in there, the yeah. issue of maintenance, planned or unplanned. Mm. Explain that to an ordinary South African like me, who does not know when you say there is enough installed capacity to cater for all of these needs I've stated above. Yeah, Koli, thank you, and thank you for inviting me here. I think it's a great honor for me to be here to hopefully uh, assist you and assist the South African to understand what exactly is the problem and what needs to be done. So let's start from the top. We currently have about 55 gigawatts of installed capacity. In this 55 gigawatt, yeah. it includes the so-called renewable energy, which is about six, six uh, gigawatts or so. Mm. So if you were to take the 55 gigawatts, remove the renewable energy, uh, because sometimes it's available, sometimes it's not available, uh, you end up with 49 gigawatts of installed capacity. Right. Of that 49, you need to take out, let's say, 3,000 or 4,000 to cater for reserves. In case of an emergency, the system is able to, to respond to that. Mm. So that takes you to about 44, 45 gigawatts of installed capacity. So out of that, on a normal day, typically the demand goes up to sometimes 28 gigawatts or sometimes 30 gigawatts. Mm. Let's assume it's 30 gigawatts. That gives you the balance of about, let's call it 15 gigawatts. Yeah. This 15 gigawatts of uh, uh, installed capacity, as, as I said in my article, it's enough to cater for planned maintenance, it's enough to cater for unplanned maintenance, and maybe, you know, unit tripping there and there, you know, but we've got enough installed capacity to arrest the current challenges that we are faced with. Let me then ask the question. The Minister of Energy, Gweda Mantashe, has been talking about 22 megawatts that is sitting idle that could be put to good use to avoid where we are. Do you have a clear understanding when he says this 22,000 megawatts is sitting idle. What is he referring to exactly? Yeah, so, so we may be using different numbers. Uh, I estimated about 15 gigawatts. Uh, let's assume the 22 gigawatts is correct. Uh, by the way, it's not idle. Uh, it's units that have broken down or units that are on plan maintenance that needs to be maintained so that they are returned back mm -hmm. to generate electricity. But it, the argument remains the same. We've right. got enough installed capacity if we just do maintenance. Even if we do uh, load sharing for a limited period yeah. and do proper maintenance with proper oversight, I believe that in the next 6 to 12 months we'll be out of the woods. <laughs> Let's then talk about what has contributed to the sudden increase in plant breakdowns. Yeah, it is true that the ESCOM fleet is old. So the plants are breaking down, but there are other contributing factors. Mm. The maintenance, I believe, that has been done probably in the last three to four years or so, I don't think it's been effective. Otherwise, you'll not have the same units coming back from a long maintenance and breaking down again. Mm. So the effectiveness of maintenance, as much as some maintenance has happened, uh, I just want to be open about that. It's not that there's no maintenance. Maintenance has happened, yeah. but the effectiveness of the maintenance that has happened, I think part of it is contributing to the situation that we're faced with. What you are saying 
if we were to get into semantics now, you're talking about maintenance that's not been effective. Are you saying that poor quality maintenance is what this ESCOM team has been doing at least for the last couple of years since under Durator took over? Are you saying that the maintenance that they have been doing has been substandard? Yeah, totally. I'm saying the maintenance that has happened has not been effective. Uh, and there's a big difference. It's not been effective. Uh, think about your car. It's an old car. And you know that you need to take it for a service. But you need it as well. So when you take it uh, to a garage or whatever for maintenance, they will just do the bare minimum and bring it back to you because you need it. You need it for generating income or whatever the case might be. Ideally, under normal circumstances, you will say to the car dealer, take this car, fix it. If it takes a week or two, bring it back when it's in a state that I can run it until the next service. This is not what has been happening at the moment at ESCOM, I believe. The maintenance that has happened, in some cases you take down the unit, you discover there is a critical spare that you need to be able to fix or replace or whatever, and it's not available. Mm -hmm. you, you then do patch-ups, you know, just to bring back the unit so that it can run for the next, uh, for the next outage. Yeah. So it's the effectiveness and the poor workmanship that I believe, and you'll see in my article, I'm talking about how do you address this, the quality of maintenance that's happening at the station the availability of critical space, the oversight, and a number of things that I'm mentioning in my article. We are going to get into those in a moment. Right now, yeah. we're just dealing with the facts as you saw them, and you say in the article that you've extrapolated these yeah. from the actual documents of ESCOM. Under director and team, as I've said earlier, they have sold the story to South Africans that maintenance is what was neglected by the team that he took over from. And you remember the uh, whole story about how these plants were run to the ground simply because the previous team was told that you run these things, otherwise you will be shown the door in order to make the nation believe that the story of load shedding really didn't exist, didn't exist or it was something that was uh, brought on deliberately. Are you saying that this team led by Andre Director, when they have been speaking about not just normal maintenance, we have heard a new term and that is reliable maintenance or reliability maintenance yeah. rather. Are you saying that again you insist on this word that the maintenance at ESCOM has been ineffective? Uh, Kole, I'm still sticking with that. The maintenance at ESCOM has been ineffective. In my article, I go into detail uh, analyzing what happened when, by the way, the problem started many years ago. It's not just a recent issue. Around 2013 or so, you could see, if you look at the numbers, that something is wrong here. Mm. There was a response, as I indicated, around 2016, uh, 2016, 2017. But that response of doing more maintenance than, you know, just running the plant, should have been retained or sustained beyond the 2016-2017 period. Unfortunately, this did not happen. The maintenance uh, uh, intensity uh, measured in terms of planned, the so-called PCLF, planned maintenance, was not sustained. And that should have been a sustained. And I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm, I deliberately went into this because there are other reasons, by the way, why the plant is not performing. The criminal activities, the corruption and whatever. But yeah. put that aside. Let's look at the technical reasons now why the plant has not uh, performed. And it boils down to maintenance. Effective maintenance has not happened. If that effective maintenance had been carried out, would we be where we are right now? I don't think so, Cody. I really don't believe we will be in this situation where we're at at the moment. Let's pick up on the energy availability factor. This is a phrase that's become commonly known <laughs> to South Africans. What is the energy availability factor and where does it sit right now in terms of percentages? Yeah, clearly <clears throat> the energy availability factor, it's the amount of energy that is available based on installed capacity, the amount of energy that is available to generate electricity and supply to the consumers. 
Uh, and this is a very important parameter. When you are managing a, 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 a fleet of electricity generation, this is one of the key things that you use to indicate whether the, you know, the fleet is performing or not performing. Yeah. It's currently at about 58, 59 uh, percent, and it may get worse. Uh, I mean, you've seen in the last couple of days uh, stage uh, six uh, load shedding being implemented, and now we're down to stage four. And, and I believe we'll probably stay at stage four to six until the end of the current financial year, which is end of March. So the financial year ending in March 2022 will probably have an EAF around 58%. My goodness. So talk to us about where this energy availability factor was in 2018. And I'm using that year deliberately because Andre Derater takes over ESCOM in the year 2019. So where was it at 2018? And if you like, you can move backwards. Yeah, so, so 2018, uh, by the way, before uh, Mr. Andre Derater took over, there was Mr. Padamani Khadebe. Hmm. So they come in uh, around 2018, they take over, we have an energy availability above 70%. Then it gradually drops. Uh, of course, there were other challenges, you know, came the COVID-19 pandemic and there were other challenges with the plant not performing, the new plant, Mitu Piku Sile, but those were since uh, addressed and, and it sort of stabilized around 65 or so. But then all of a sudden in 2022, it just dropped all the way up to 50, 50, 58%. Now, if this is not addressed, at least to stabilize it, Mm. and I'm now thinking about the worst case scenario, stabilize it at 58% so that it doesn't go below 58%. Because if it goes below 50%, then we, you know, the disaster that I spoke about, we have a disaster on our hands. Yeah. You seem to have studied the goings-on at ESCOM because in that article, you then go on to propose the steps that are needed and you talk about the nine urgent steps that need to be done in order to reduce the severity of load shedding right now. Let's start with, um, I'm going to pick and choose yeah, yeah. the ones that I thought stood out for me. You are proposing that the president declares a national state of disaster for electricity supply. How will this help in the current situation? Yeah, so probably we've been through this crisis and we've been through emergencies in the past i think we've reached a point where i believe it's now a national disaster uh, the hospitals are not getting the necessary power that they need the schools are suffering individuals are suffering let alone people that may be you know their health compromised as a result of this and you have to go back to what is the definition of a disaster a disaster is when an event does take place and the communities are affected and the communities are not either able because they don't have the resources or it will take too much effort for them to respond to that uh, incident. And we are in that situation. Mm. And hence, I am proposing that the president of the country declares a national disaster. That enables a number of things to, to start taking place. Yeah. Uh, one of the key challenges that ESCOM is faced with is procurement. It's a state-owned entity. There's rules in terms of how you do procurement in a state-owned entity. Sometimes when you need to procure critical spares at short notice, you can't do it because there's long processes that you have to follow to be able to do the necessary. You cannot just pick up the phone. Even if you know that the critical spare that you're looking for is supplied by Koli. Yeah. You have to uh, talk to Mdu, talk to Sipo before you get to Koli. Now, the national disaster, if it's declared, it will allow, of course, under control uh, 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 situation. We don't want the PPE situation that happened during the covid 19 period, uh, it will then allow the procurement to take place very quickly. It will allow the deployment of resources to take place very quickly, decisions to be made uh, you know, very quickly to be able to arrest the current challenges that we are faced with. I'm going to move fast yeah. with these nine urgent steps. The other one, you are proposing a maintenance budget per power station and you are saying that this ought to be maintained for five years. And add to this what you say should accompany uh, this budget per power station is a stage three load shedding for a period 
of 12 months. Explain the rationale there. So, you release a budget for the next five years hmm. that allows ESCOM to place contracts. You know, for the next five years, it allows the contractors to mobilize resources. In some cases, it allows them to manufacture components that are required. So, that's where the five year is coming from. Hmm. There must be that commitment, not just committing for the next 12 months or whatever, for the it, especially the multinationals, for them to mobilize their resources and uh, even push for their critical space to be you know, prioritized in, in their manufacturing line, they need that commitment. As a minimum, I'm proposing that five years. They yeah. need to, uh, so they need a budget to be released. They need contracts to be placed for, for five years. Now, you need this budget to be released per power station. And in my article, I go into pain and explaining that the main man or woman at the center of this recovery must be the power station manager. And this person must have full delegation to make decisions and, and, and not spend too much time writing motivations to different committees and different individuals and not make the decisions. Even at national office at ESCOM? Even at national office, sometimes ESCOM is required to get permission from national treasury and it delays the decision-making process. So, so you need to give delegation to the power station manager to be able to recover from this current uh, disaster that we are faced with at, at, at this point in time. And then one of the most interesting that stands out for me among your proposals is what you say should be the outsourcing of the maintenance work, maintaining these power plants, and this is who they ought to be outsourced to. They must be outsourced to the original equipment manufacturers for a minimum of 10 years. Why is this important? Again, uh, over the years, a lot of the OEMs have sort of diversified because they saw, especially the coal business in South Africa, they didn't see a future in that. Uh, for right reasons, the country is pursuing renewable energy going into the future, but we still have the coal fleet to maintain. Yeah. Now, if I'm an original equipment manufacturer, and I see that the business in South Africa is dwindling, and, you know, I get contracts for two years or whatever, I'll start looking at other markets where I can invest and, you know, make profit in those markets. So the 10-year period, it will lock the OEMs, you know, so that they invest, not only invest in terms of supplying the equipment, invest in terms of developing the skills, mm -hmm. setting up, you know, SMMEs in the country, etc., empowering the SMMEs to do some of the work on their behalf or whatever. Now... The, the outsourcing, and this must not be confused with privatization of ESCO, the, the outsourcing will be for a limited period. Yeah. And I'm not now suggesting that, you know, ESCO as a state-owned entity now starts, you know, privatizing and giving power stations to private sector. No. For a limited period, we'll well-defined milestones in terms of what needs to happen and benefits and, and penalties and whatever to the OEMs that will be supporting the ESCOM teams to do the, the maintenance. Dr. Mata, we're winding down. Of all the issues that we've spoken about, what needs to be done immediately in order to protect the stability of the national grid? Holly, and I'm glad the president is already doing that. Yeah. Number one, we need an actionable plan, national plan, what to do to recover from the current crisis that we are faced with. Are you saying that the plans that have been put out thus far, they don't talk to what you think needs to be done there? No, I, I don't think so. It, 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 to some extent, they talk to the medium term, long term, etc., etc. But I'm talking about an immediate plan that can be actioned tomorrow. And I'm hoping uh, the president, through his consultation, that's, this is what they're talking about yeah. in terms of what can be actionable next week and i'm hoping the president will make an announcement in the next maybe 24 hours or so to say south africans fellow south africans these are the marching orders yeah so and so must do this must do that by this time and whatever and this is the decree this is what i'm looking forward to and and that's the line of thinking that i've interrupted so you yeah. were still on these immediate plans correct. that ought to be implemented starting tomorrow correct and, and clearly, some of them are in my article. Yeah. I mean, I'm hoping the president or his advisors have read it. They basically need to take that plan and, you know, consult on it, of course, and action it. And they may want to improve on it. They may want to add certain things to it. 
but it's already there. Yeah. Final question, sir. I'm aware that you made a presentation at the de Department of Minerals and Energy just yesterday. Simple question. Who invited who? Yeah, actually, I was part of a delegation that was at the MRE yesterday. Yeah. Um, and it's normal. I mean, every now and then, you know, we go to the DMRE and we make presentations. As uh, part of the institution that you lead? That's correct, yeah. Okay. That, that is correct. But uh, we're faced with a national disaster as far as I'm concerned. Hmm. So, so I will be happy to participate in any structure, respond and make suggestions, etc., like I've done through my article. And how was that presentation received? by the minister. Was he there, by the way? No, no, no. I, he was not part of the session yesterday. Yeah, actually. So I'm just wondering who's giving you this information that I was at the team <laughs> yesterday. <probably. laughs> so perhaps what South Africans would want to know, I mean, you seem to have studied ESCOM thoroughly, and you are an engineer by trade. If a call came to say, Dr. Mate, would you be able to lead ESCOM? Would you take up the job? <laughs> if it's a, it's a call to duty, you know, uh, if it's something that I have to do to save the country, uh, I'll cross that bridge when, <laughs> when I get there. But uh, I think all of us, including yourselves as journalists as well, we should be getting ourselves to, you know, to roll up our sleeves and, you know, and assist the country to get out of the current challenges that we are faced with. Yeah. Dr. Zonani Mate, it's been a pleasure talking to you and uh, thank you very much for an incisive piece that you have written. I really set up and understood exactly where ESCOM is at the moment and what needs to be done. He is the CEO of the National Energy Development Institute. This is an entity that was uh, established under the National Energy Act back in 2000. And eight. If you want to read that article, you just uh, do yourself a favor and go to Engineering News, and it should be able, uh, you should be able to pick it up very easily.